President of the RCA board. So, welcome. Um, we are very happy to be back live in person as well as on Zoom. So, thank you all for coming. Um, I'd like to in introduce, I knew him as coach. So. Still the coach. Still the coach. <laughs> but this is Jim Howard, and he was the wrestling coach for many, many, many years at the at uh, Swigo. And I and it was yanking his chain a little bit earlier because he interviewed me for a position at the college I had a summer job about 38 years ago. <laughs> so oh. so we've, been, we've been doing our campus memories. But anyway, he has a lot of props here with him today. I'll use props, is probably not the best word, but he's had a lot of things for us to look at, a lot of things to talk about. He's already given me a lot to think about, so I know he's going to have really great information for all of you. And so, um, just very quickly, if you're not a member of Rice Creek Associates, there are pamphlets on the table if you're interested. Our prices are very reasonable. So um, but they're just, just around the corner here if anybody's interested. And please make sure before you leave that you did sign in so we have an accurate um, representation of how many people are here. And I'll just introduce Kamal Mohammed is the director of Rice Creek and I'll let him take a look. Welcome back. Um, it's good to be face to face um, after 18 months. I just want to make an announcement, a special one. Um, everybody, we have with us Andy Nelson, um, a previous director. And Andy did well more than anybody else um, in his position at the time. So if, if you want to check our website, you will see the floor of Rice Creek, uh, which was Andy Nelson um, accomplishment. Um, so welcome Andy and uh, Mary Ann. Okay, here we go. Uh, before we get started, we have honey for everybody. So make sure you grab a bottle of honey before you leave. Our uh, address is on there, but the phone number on there is an old number. So don't call that number. My phone number is, if you want to write it down, is 315-591-4234. Okay, and that's the highs of Howard. This is my able assistant with me, Jake Garcia. Jake's going to do a couple of things at the end of the show that have to be done outside. So let's get a couple of uh, challenges here. How many people are thinking about maybe having bees themselves. I know it's a couple of them. Okay, so we'll try to make sure that we, we touch a little bit on, on uh, the hows and whys and, and maybes of, of raising bees yourself. And, uh, and I'm very willing to help, very willing to mentor people. I have a young man who's right up at the end of the driveway here on the right-hand side. And you may have noticed coming in, he's got two highs. He's a brand new, he's a newbie. And uh, we had, we are, he's already had a couple challenges that we've solved. So don't hesitate to get a hold of me if and when you really want to do the bee thing. And the, the people that go back and forth from Florida, they, they should have hives down in Florida and hives up here so they can be regular bee keepers. Anyway, <laughs> we're both happy to be here because this is fun for us. We get to, to tell you what, what we think is a fantastic hobby. We get to, to share with you the really good stuff that is happening around us with bees. Because without bees, we would probably not have some of the fruits and vegetables as we know them. We probably still have them, but we might not have them the way you like it at this point in time. Anyway, so we did the Dr. Sine's class. Where is she? she? She Okay, we did her class on Tuesday. So this is where we have the, uh, the college students come to our Apriori, one of the apriories at 52 Singleton Street. And, uh, and we take him, we go, we go in the highs, we, the college brought head nets, so we put head nets on them and, and we go in and really get into the bee business. Uh, they ask a different question this year than, than I've had before. 
So, and I'm going to share it with you. They asked me, how did you get into this stuff? How did you get into beekeeping? All the, all the kids wanted to know. All right, here's how this happened. Uh, I was a wrestling coach here for a long time. And our NCAA wrestling championships were out on the West Coast. And while we were out there, my sister lived a little bit south of uh, San Francisco. So I went, well, took the team out there and, and we wrestled and then I sent them back with an assistant coach. And I stayed with her for four days. And she had three hives in her backyard, three beehives. Uh, they were, these are Italian bees that we have. These were not Italian bees. These were another type of bees. And uh, so, and she was into this stuff. I mean, she was in that hive and she had the old smoker out. And, and she really captivated my interest. So uh, I ended up three days with her and I think I was in the hive more than she was. So I came back and my wife said, all right, we gotta have a couple hives. So we, we had two hives. And as I told the class the other day, when I first started in the beginning, we weren't beekeepers, we were honey takers. We took the honey at the end of the year. We watched the bees a lot. We kind of helped them a little bit. I think we might have fed them a few times, but we weren't beekeepers. We, we did not go into those hives. We did in great length and, and we did not do what beekeepers need to do to make the hive better than it is. In Oswego, New York, because we're in the frozen north, it's important that you learn how to winter over your hives. This is one of the biggest challenges we have today is to get our hives through the winter. Back in the, in the early days, when I first started, we went from two hives to four hives to eight hives to 16 hives and then to 30 hives. But I had three grandchildren helping me. So it was fun. You know, I had ready help. Price was right. And uh, we had a good time. Uh, then they grew up. They went to college. They have their own families. And all of a sudden, we're left with 30 hives. So we had a quick downgrade. So we have, at present time, we have somewhere between 15 and 18 hives, which Jake and I manage pretty good. The good news about all this is that for the first time in many years, and maybe the only time I can remember, honey prices are at their very best right now. The, the price nationally for a one pound jar of honey is somewhere around $9. And for a two pound bottle, which is our popular sailing, uh, bottle, uh, you know, we can get $13 now. And that's good because beekeepers have for years have had a hard time making a living if you don't have a thousand hives. If you have a thousand hives, you can make a nice living and you can blow away the ones that you lose every year. But if you're trying to survive with 500 hives, that's tough duty because you're trying to keep those hives healthy, wealthy and wise the whole year instead of just, you know, once in a while going and looking and, and try to do some adjustments. All right, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna start, and I'm gonna talk a, a lot about bees. And if you have a burning question that's really bugging you, ask me as we're going through, because if you wait to the end, you're probably gonna forget. I, used, I do a lot of schools, and I'm gonna tell this one story. So I'm doing a Hannibal third grade. I got all the Hannibal third graders in one great big room like this. And the, with third graders, you know, they're pretty active. They, they get bored pretty quick, so you got to keep moving. But I told them in the beginning, now listen, if you got a burning question, don't hesitate to, to ask it. I'm going to give you this chance at the end of a little talk here. Not going to talk long, just going to talk a little bit. And, and then you got a question, you raise your hand, and we'll, we'll try to answer. And the best questions come from you guys, come from the little kids. So they, they kind of agreed to that. And so we went out about our way, and we were, we were pretty short. And so I said, okay, time for questions. And bingo, right in front, this one little kid shot up his head. I go, oh, I know this is not about bees. And I said, hold it, I gotta, we gotta qualify these questions. We don't wanna know about your mother getting stung. We don't wanna know about your sister getting stung on her foot because she didn't have shoes on like mother told her to. We don't wanna know any of that. We wanna know burning questions, something that you just, and boy, this little guy, he's still going at it. He's still got that head going like, oh, I know it's not going to be good. So I didn't call on him. I called on some of the girls and he's not giving up, man. He's staying there. He's still waving a hand. And so I looked at him. Finally, I said, all right, what is your question? 
And he looked me right straight in the eye and he goes, what are those things in your ears? Oh. And I go, whoa, that's one of the best questions we've ever had. And I started in on this story about how the bees, bees communicate with me. And I got these little hearing aids in here. And, and of course, the teachers are going, no, 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 no. I'm telling them that they're going to go home and they're going to tell their parents that we're all going to look bad. So I did. Anyway, that's a true story about the Hannibal third graders. All right, I think that um, one of the most interesting things are the bees themselves. We brought bees with us. We, these are Italian bees. There's 122 different types of bees in the US of A. Uh, when I first started, we had a line of bees called star lion bees. And star lions are good because they're very docile. They're easy to work, no problems, but they don't winter well. Uh, and then we went from star lions to buck bass bees. And buck bass bees are known all over the world, particularly England. And, uh, and they were okay. They were, they were very docile. They made a lot of honey. But again, the, the scourging winters that we have here are just, just tough. So we are now, we've tried some other kinds of bees, but right now we're sticking with the Italians. And uh, the lady asked me earlier, did they come from Italy? Well, originally they did. That's why we call them Italian bees. But, uh, and if you put your ear up here, you can hear them buzzing in Italian. <laughs> if you speak Italian, you might be able to communicate with them. I don't speak Italian, so I don't. So Jake and I have to learn what they mean when they buzz around us and tell us we don't want you in the hive today. And there are times when the bees will communicate with you. And I strongly suggest that you understand that they are trying to, to talk to you and trying to tell you something. And I'm going to give you a couple examples of this. I was out the other day and I went out to the orchard because we have, when we extract the honey, the, the, the box, the original box that the honey was stored in after we kicked it out and, and drained it out of the box, uh, we put those boxes back on the hive and let the bees clean them up. And we have a, maybe a, 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 we have a stack here and maybe eight and four of the eight are being cleaned that are on top. And out in the northwest corner of the orchard, right over here on top of the other of the, the hill where Danny lives, uh, we had six hives over in that one little apiary. And I said, I can do this without smoke because the dead gum smoker is sitting in my barn back at 52 Singleton Street. <laughs> so I'm going to get the top off this hive and I'm going to put our Where's our little, uh... so I'm going to put on top of this, a buck, which we're going to pass around. I've lost it here somewhere. It's here. Anyway, it drives the bees out. It's a smell that the bees, I guess, don't like. It drives them down in the hive, gets them out of the box. And we take a blower and we finish the job by blowing them out the door. And, uh, and then we put it back and we bring it back to 52 Singleton Street and we, and we store it in a bar. And we stack them like there's probably 12 high. We go four hives and we put some mothballs and we go four boxes and more mothballs and, and we put it on top. Of course, the, the mothball smell goes down. It does not go up and it goes down into the hive. It keeps the uh, mice, keeps the other insects that attack your comb, which is very important to us and uh, hard to grow, although we're gonna show you some synthetic stuff today and let you look at it, see what you think. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, that, that's what we did. So the coach is in there and he's analyzing this hive. This hive is noted to be a little bit on the grumpy side sometimes, okay? So he takes the brick off, he's good there, takes the top off very carefully, lays it down, he's good there. Now he's gotta get the inner cover off. All right, and uh, this is an inner cover. All right, so understand I'm up in the air now like this with my arms because the hive's got eight stacks on it. So I'm, I loosen this up with my hive tool and I say, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. I got right about here and the top of the hive came alive. Every single one of those bees is out there trying to sting me. I mean, I got stung probably 15 times before I got the other cover back on. And of course there's a hole in here and they found that right away. And, and so I was essentially running for my life. I was really getting stung. Now we get stung all the time. And uh, 
obviously we don't react to it or we wouldn't be in the business. And uh, somebody asked me earlier, we get stung in the spring and we swell up and we have little black dots on it. If you look at my hands, I have a lot of little black dots. Everywhere there's a black dot, that means I got stung. Half the time we know we're getting stung, half the time we don't know we're getting stung because after a while you just get kind of used to it. So anyway, I, the moral of that story is, is you always use smoke when you go in the hive. All right, we have all different size smokers that we use. He's gonna show you at the end of the show here how to light one of these, because it is an art all by itself. And to keep it going, and to keep from having hot smoke blowing on the bees, we want nice cool smoke blowing on the bees. Anyway, a little puff of this at the doorway where the guard bees are. And then on top of the hives, particularly in the fall, after you've taken the boxes off, taken them home, extracted the honey out of, of course they're gonna be up there, they're cleaning. And so a little puff of smoke on the top, live happily ever after. I did not do that. You know, I've been in the business 45 years and I still don't learn things. A little smoke. So the smoker is of great value. What does the smoker do? It kind of neutralizes all smells. Bees know us by our pheromones. We have a smell. Jake has a smell, I have a smell. They recognize that. They come out and they'll fly around our head. And, and they, what they're doing is they're taking a little whiff of our wind and it's, ah, we know that guy, he's a friendly beekeeper. We're gonna let him go in here today. It's his lucky day. So we get a chance to go in and work the hive with a little smoke, all right? What we don't do is do what I did. All right, on to the next. Now, as I said, we have a tie in bees and I want you to come up maybe afterwards and, and look at some of these because a real, story of the bees are in this particular uh, little framework that we have here. The queen lays eggs. The queen is a very fussy soul. In fact, the queen has no time for birth control. All right, and why, that is why you see today so many, many female bees. Males that get, get kicked out in the winter, guys, you don't wanna be a male bee. When we go into hives, the middle of uh, November, maybe just to take one quick look, there's no males in there. It's all female. It's a female thing. The workforce of the world, of course, it's a female. All right. So the, the female queen lays an egg. And, and here's the way this goes. It goes egg, 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 larvae, 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 12 days. Pupa, 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 hatch. Okay. And with the male bee, it is one thing. With a female bee, it's something else. The drone bee takes 24 days. All right, from the egg, 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 poop, 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 poop. All right, the worker bees, 21 days till it hatches. And the queen bee, if you're fortunate enough to raise your own queens, which we've done, 16 days. All right, and then that bee hatches. And as soon as, uh, We'll talk a little bit about that maybe first here, but you're gonna see, I'm gonna pass all this stuff around so you'll get a chance to look at, at frames and where we've had live bees and, and so on and so forth. So, but anyway, okay, now the bee is on its first entrance into life on the planet. Okay, the first two, three days, it kind of stays in the same area that it was hatched in. Okay, and during that time, attempts to keep the rest of the brood around it warm because understand they're all hatching about the same time within 30 seconds of each other. Hatch, 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 hatch. Okay, and so the bee is a hatch, it comes out, kicks away all the stuff that's on top of itself from, from busting out of, the, out of the cone and goes to work keeping the rest of the area warm. How do they keep it warm? By moving their abdomen. Their abdomen's going up and down. You get 30,000 of these little suckers doing that, they can heat it up. The center, in fact, I tell this story right now, the center of the ball, and that's what bees do in the, in the wintertime, they go into a ball with a queen in the center. The center of that ball, when it's minus seven, is 95 degrees. Now, I bet against this. A friend of mine is a physician and lives in Manlius, New York. And, uh, and he said, oh, I believe it. He says, I believe it's 95. He said, we're gonna try it this winter. So ring, 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 calls me up, says six degrees below zero. We're gonna check it right now. And so what he had, he had a high-speed drill. First of all, I took his stethoscope and he went around and listened 
and tried to find out where that bundle of bees was. And then when he found it, he had to ascertain, you know, was the buzz maybe more significant here or here? So anyway, he found what he thought was the center of the bundle of bees in there, but this high speed drill, he drilled it all the way in there, pulled that sucker out, had a nice little gauge, temperature gauge, just shoved that sucker in there, left it there six seconds, pulled it out, it's 95 degrees. Minus six to 95 degrees in the center of that ball. Now understand, depending on what size the ball was, and that differs with your hive. We have some hives that have 70,000 bees and we have lots of hives that have 30,000 bees. We have many hives that have 50,000 bees. Okay, so depending on the size of that ball, all right, the bees move very slowly. Frames in between them, they move up. Bees always move up, they never move down. And the reason they're going like this and around is they're going to the food supply. So the outside of that bundle of bees is taking the food in the middle, sharing it all the way, all the way to the queen, all the way back out, they're bringing waste. They do not go to the bathroom in their hive. Sunny day, once in a while, you'll see a lot of bees come out of a hive quick, do a quick cleansing flight, boom, right back in and down back into the bundle. All right, so here's this bundle and it keeps moving until the coach gets home around April 1st and we take the top off and our bees are all alive and we're happy. It's hard to keep them alive unless we go to New York. We'll talk more on that in a minute. Okay, now we're back to the next four days of the life of the bees life. They're feeding larvae, They're feeding the larvae that's in their area. Around every comb, around every frame within the comb, you're gonna see honey up in each corner and down in the lower corners. And so the bee runs over, picks up a droplet of food, runs over and feeds it to another bee that's just hatching or feeds it to a bee who has been out gathering something, come all the way up through the hive, get ready to hand it off to somebody else to transfer into the, into the comb. They may feed that bee, that bee also. Okay, so they feed larvae, larvae, so and all that stuff for about 11 days. Then from day 12 to day 15, they are capable of contributing wax to the show, okay? And as you see, as we pass out some of this stuff, you're gonna see that, that there's, they use the wax not only in making comb, they use the wax to hold things together. They use wax with a little bit of glue in it that they, that they uh, hold things together. They, any cracks where the wind might come through, bees are up in there patching those with the wax and the glue that they're making in their stomach. The honeybee has two stomachs, just like a cow, regurgitates this stuff back and forth, all right? And that's what produces the honey. This is what makes the sweetness of the honey. Part of the sweetness is from the sweet sweetness that they gathered out there from the, that particular time of the year and, and the fact that they regurgitated it back and forth between these two stomachs. So they do a lot with these two stomachs back and forth. All right, then they move on and my little chart here says, day 18, 19, 20, they might go and be a guard bee. That's not true anymore. We have some recent research done, done by a, a nice gentleman down in North Carolina that has now kind of proved that the guards, the guards that I told you about that at the front of the hive and the guards that are up in the top of the hive, okay, go directly from hatching to being a guard. They go to the doorway, they're trained by other guards, and they, they're guards the rest of their life. He actually put dots on bees, colored dots, and, and, and tracked them all the way through. Guard bees are an elite force. All right, on day 21, in most cases, somewhere between day 15 and day 21, hoorah, the bee gets a chance to go out and forage and be of what he or she thinks is helpful to the hive. And so watch that Jacob may fall. <coughs> okay, so the last 23 days to 35 days of the bee's life is spent foraging. They forage on what is available at that time of the year. Three years ago, we had some of our hives that were, I think there was four at this particular, 
and they were down by the Bartlett pears. Now the Bartlett pears usually are the first blossoms that come out that they really need to pollinate. And the reason you need to pollinate Bartlett pears is the best pears are the ones that are right next to the trunk of the tree. Okay, the honeybee will go in through all of these through the foliage and, and pollinate that. Okay, pollinate means it goes in there, it touches, it touches one petal, touches another petal, and, and the flower becomes not just drab looking red, it becomes a bright and glorious red because it's been pollinated. Okay, and the honeybee is the only one insect that will pollinate the best Bartlett parrot. Doesn't mean that other insects don't pollinate, just means that the honeybee does the best job because it will go in close to the to the trunk of the tree. We'll pollinate those pears. And those pears that you buy at the market, they're nice and yellow, nice and fat. And we're pollinated by a honeybee. Okay, now <clears throat> another story for, like I think it was five years ago. We had a strange winter that particular year. And for some reason, there was some kind of a blossom in the forest. And I call that out there a forest down over on the, on the hill over here where my beehives are, it's a forest on either side. Anyway, there's a lot of sweetener in the forest. So the majority of the bees howl 15 to 21 days, 15 to 32 days, maybe even 15 to 55 days. And that's the winter bee. Okay, they're out there doing their thing. They're doing their pollination. So they're in the forest gathering this sweetener and they're flying back in, bringing it in. They come in through the doorway, they pass it on to another bee who runs it upstairs and plugs it in one of the holes in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the structure of the interior part of the hive. All right, and up they go again. And so they do this, they go back and forth, back and forth. They actually wear themselves up. Normal honeybees live somewhere between 38 and 46 days. And they don't die from disease, they die from wearing themselves out. They are relentless. They come out the door, they go get it, they bring it back. They go out, they get it, and they bring it back. Okay, and that's the story of pollination. Questions? Nobody's asked me a question yet. I can't believe this. I was not being any good. Okay. So the number of bees in the hive in winter and the rest of the year, is that the same number? It is a number, and the number is 55. The number is 55 days the winter bee Will, will survive. The winter bee is a different bee. The winter bee has a different mentality. The winter bee is okay with staying home, moving its abdomen, keeping the hive warm. Okay, the summer bee is not okay with that. The summer bee wants to travel, bring back, you know, make themselves look, look good and also be helpful to the hive. Okay, so, but the winter bee can live 55 days and all it does is this. Abdomen, abdomen, abdomen. 30,000 abdomens, okay? In the center of the ball, 95 degrees. Answer the question? No, I meant the number of bees in the hive. Is that number the same in winter and summer? No. And they downsize themselves. I told you they kicked the bit males out first. So about this time of year, you go around to our boxes and you'll see a pile of drones out front. They kick the drones out. Not good to be a drone in the fall. You get kicked out of the hive. Okay, and then as winter goes on, the transition between the 38-day-year-old bee and the 55-day-old bee happens. Don't ask me how. Ask the queen, okay? Because for some reason, these bees are okay. We live so the, the number in the hive, which was 70,000 at the beginning of the fall, may only be 30,000 in the winter time. Okay, so we got a 30,000 bee ball moving. Some dying, when they die, boom, they get them right out of it. We have funeral director bees. That's their whole job in life is they take the dead bees outdoors, even in the wintertime. If the sun comes out, the bee will make a cleansing flight. It may carry another bee with it and drop it because it's dead and it's laying in the morgue. And boom, out that door. There are no dead, smelly bees in the hive, if it's healthy, come spring. Hive smells good. good. They get the dead out of there really quick. I'm amazed that they're able to do the question. Um, I know ants will have like certain areas where like they keep their dead. Do they have an area like that in the hive before they like take it back? Like a out? morgue? Yeah, like a morgue. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I really don't. I would think that 
they probably the, the funeral director bees that's their job in, for life remember okay okay they probably are dragging that closer to the doorway and the first chance they get boom out they go and i'm going to show you all this in real life here in a minute in, in the, when we take the hive apart okay so my answer to that is i'm not sure but i, I think it's fairly quick first time they get a question Jim, what are the characteristics of these Italian bees that make them so valuable to you as opposed to others that you want? Oh, I made it for the money. No, oh, no, I made it for the honey money, honey. Okay. Uh, some eyes are more protective of two hives side by side, 30,000 bees in each. One comes out with 200 pounds of honey, the other one comes out 100 pounds of honey. And we've had this happen even this year. Okay, some hives are just more industrious, just like people. You know, there's some people work hard all the time and they're rewarded by making more money. So the 30,000 beehive that turned out 200 pounds of honey for us, yay for them, we're happy. But we don't have a control over that. I suppose it's, somebody will figure this out someday, exactly you know, what happens through all this wintering process. But so far, we don't really know. By the way, only the last 25 years has there been really serious research done with bees. We did not have blind in studies. We did not have good scientific studies with bees until really only the last 25 to 30 years. Remember that the bee population originally came from Europe. Uh, it came over with Columbus, I hope. But I'm not sure about that either. <laughs> but anyway, they came over early because the early settlers had bees. All right. And how did they how did they do that pollinating then? How did they do without pollinating? Yeah. Probably their vegetables, their fruits, their potatoes were pretty bland, not good. That was edible, but not tasty. And and that's what we're talking about with fruits and vegetables. The tasty stuff, there still would be pears, there still would be peaches, there still would, there still would be grapes, but they wouldn't be as you like them. They would be very bland. So it's important that that pollination takes place. As I said, we have like 30,000, or we have uh, 30 hives in the beginning, and now we're down to 15. I, I really think we're doing something for the echo business of, of our area. I think we have something to do with some of the good taste and fruit that you get from the orchard, okay, or that, I think, I think our potatoes are better. The ones I grow in my garden are better because three hives right in front of them. They get pollinated really good. Yes, Wendy. Jim, so how many bees do we have right here? Right here we have, I'm gonna guess, what do you think, Jake? 300? Yeah. 150 so. per side? Yeah. Did we tell you the story about this hive yet? We haven't told that story. Okay, well, an observation hive is a lot of fun. The kids at the market love it. Kids come every week, look for that queen, find that queen. Sometimes I give them a prize, sometimes I don't tell them. They all want me to mark the queen. I will not mark the queen, you have to find it. Queen's longer, fatter, no stripes. Very simple, longer, fatter, no stripes. Yeah, trying to find it when you need it. Like when we're trying to find Scott's queen up here. He's got a queen that delivering really aggressive bees. One hive of his is really, really tough to manage. They're stinging you just if you walk by it. So we had to find that queen. We had to get rid of that queen. We plugged in a new queen and they're living happily ever after. Question. Why do you know the age of the queen of Try that on me again. Why do you know the age of the queen of What did she say? <laughs> Try it again. Masks, the masks are killing me. No, I, I read your lips. They don't hear one. Try it again. I said, how do you know the age of the queen of Trump? If we don't mark the queen? We know there's a queen. How do you think we would know if there's a queen in there? Pardon Yeah, she wanted to know the age of the queen. Oh, the age? Queens will live seven years. We keep them for two. They're out of eggs after two years. Probably, we like the queen in the observation hive to be an old queen. Living happily ever after, just moseying around, you know. We don't want a lot of bees in that hive. The kids support a lot of bees. So we try to put an old bee in there, but um, so the answer to your question is, you know, two years about it for the queens that we have. Now, we keep sometimes really good notes. In each hive is a little plastic affair and it has a check sheet 
and we're supposed to check off this, write notes. Sometimes we do very good with it. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we're in a big hurry. Sometimes we're, we're ready to go on to the next and we don't do a good job of keeping records. And when we don't, we're asking ourselves, do you remember? Do you remember this? You know, the queen two years old, how old is she? Uh, I think she's three years old, let's get rid of her. But we don't do it that way. We look at the brood. If there's a nice strong look at a lot of nice tan brood chambers, no whole lot of holes in it, just a few holes. We got a strong queen. As long as we got a strong queen, we're happy with it. I don't know, as we know, maybe out of, out of 18 hives, we might know the age of three queens. The other ones, we just, we look at the brood chamber. And we, again, you're gonna see that when you come up, if you come up and look, you'll, you'll see. Cause this, this hive here now in, in the front part, it's pretty holy. And holy, I mean, that where the brood is stored, you know, you go five circles with nothing in it and five circles with something in it. It shouldn't be that way. The whole thing should be nice, tan, all brood. Question. Yes, when you take the honey, are you depriving the bees? Are they getting a tough time in the up for that? Or? No. We, we, never, we never take enough honey that the hive would be. And, and we try not to interrupt uh, the brood function. You know, the queen's laying eggs. We try not to go down in. What, the beginning beekeeper, Scott, my man, Scott up here. Scott wants to go inside every day. He wants to go down inside. He wants to look at it. He wants to talk to his queen. Scott, don't do that. Don't, every time you open up that hive, it takes three days for him to recover. So don't go in there all the time. You know, watch the bees going in and out the door. See if they look happy. Okay, if they look happy, leave alone. You know, don't go in there. But it's hard for a beginner. I had the same trouble. I'm very curious. I want to go in there and see what's happening, man. I want to make sure my bees are going to survive. Listen, you learn after a while. You just suck it up and wait. That was the question. So I have two questions as an opposite question. Um, I need, I have three hives. I have done zero with those hives all year. They're living their best life. <laughs> they do have one honey super on each of them that I put in there. Now, I'm not in a place where I can get to them very often. And so I am wondering, do I just leave that honey leave them on, on it? I wouldn't touch it. Just leave it all winter. Leave them. Yeah. Did you only have one box of honey? I didn't even look. I haven't looked. They're down in New Jersey. I never get to see them. Um, How do you know they didn't swarm? Oh, well, I, when I'm down there, I check to see who's, they may have swarmed. I mean, that might have happened, and yeah. I'm not I worried about smart. it. Yeah. Yeah. No. Right. But they, that's right, you don't but, know. But I didn't actually get rid of them until, I didn't, I didn't move them until early June, and I did actually catch a swarm this summer, and this spring, and I had to give it to a neighbor, but I caught, caught one last, started with two eyes, and uh, right. it keeps growing, yeah. so. Um, anyway, that's my question. Just leave the honey swarm. I wouldn't leave them alone, I would. But on the other hand, when you go, if and when you go in there, if there's a ton of bees that are packed really tight, they can still swarm on you. We used to think that bees only swarmed in, in the month of June. That's not true. Bees swarm all summer long. They swarm for a lot of reasons. They swarm, number one, because they don't have enough room. Okay, number two, there's a disease in the hive. Uh, and number three, they're not happy with that queen. Number four, there's too many drones in there. There's a lot of reasons why they, why they, why they swarm. When they swarm, you know what I'm talking about when I say swarm? That means a whole bunch of bees leave the hive. And how many? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. But at least half the hive goes with the swarm. The old queen goes with the swarm. The, the queen is given enough notice, 10 days and we're out of here. Okay, she starts laying eggs. And now they build some queen cells, which are much bigger. Queen cells the size of my little finger. Uh, you'll see seven of them at least seven, sometimes many more. I mean, you see at least seven, okay? First queen out, the winner, because she kills all the other queens. <laughs> is that good for the hive? Sometimes we don't want that queen that survives. There's a better queen coming. You know, we don't know that. One queen looks like the other queen. If you can tell me the difference between two queens when they had, I will give you the Medal of Honor of Deism because <laughs> I just don't know, just like, I don't know one bee from the other. Is he from the Northwest corner or is he from our house? He followed us here. We went up to Danny's the other day. We stopped down, we brought a whole load of bees. They were with us. They were in the back of the truck. And when we left, half of them stayed there, 200 bees. 
Okay, the uh, who came? Who came? The, the, the FedEx guy came. He wanted to go in their driveway. Too many bees. <laughs> Number one, if you see, and this holds true with yellow jackets, most hornets, almost all bumblebees, if a bee is near you and it flies around you, remember one thing. All it's getting is your pheromones. Just wants to know what you smell like. All right? It will not bother you. If you go like that, that's like, okay, you want to fight? Here we come. You and I. Okay. Do not do any, none of this kind of stuff. Bees get very nervous when you do that. When I was getting stung the other day, I got, as I told you, I got stung 15, 16 times. The only thing I was doing was yelling. Because <laughs> you're hurting me. Yeah, I get, I get one. I, even, oh, I was really nervous and jerky, but we got out of there all right. And by worse for wear, no. In fact, all my arthritis is gone. That's good. <laughs> all right. We actually sting people to get rid of arthritis. You know, we do a thing called apotherapy, where we actually sting people's joints. And, and we can make a difference. We can make a difference, particularly if you're the wife of my dermatologist who has just passed away. But uh, she has a disease where, where she is ill a lot. And he would send away and get 66 beads every two months. And he would sing her four to eight times every day. And it kept her alive. Not only did it keep her alive, but now she's able to go out, tend her gardens, sit on a porch now and then she can't drive. But she's alive, well, and healthy because of bee sting therapy, APA therapy. If you don't believe me, look it up on that computer, APA, A P I T A T R A P Y, APA therapy. You'd be surprised what it'll help. I'm not kidding you. I have two arthritis. I was a wrestler. And the one place I got injured was my thumbs. I have arthritic thumbs. I get stung all the time. Man, I don't have any arthritis. During the summer, during the fall, during the spring, I don't have any arthritis. But let me go down to Myrtle Beach and start playing golf. I start getting stiff. So I can't wait to get at my bee so I can sting. I'm going to sting myself in a minute here and show you some of this stuff. All right, any more questions on the, on the honeybee itself? We could go on and on about the honeybee, but I want to show you this living's quarters. Well, if you sting yourself, that kills the bee, correct? It does. And they don't. If we, if we mourn for it, really, we do. <laughs> we give them the old salute. But yes, when the bee stings you, it is the honeybee, only the honeybee. And it does not apply to the queen. The queen can sing, sting, sting, sting. So if you get stung by a queen, don't think it's all over because it's not. But she can keep stinging you. But the normal female bee that stings you dies because half its guts go with it. We're going to show you that in a minute when I sting myself. Another question. Okay, let's go through the hive first because, oh, lots of questions. Um, with things like herbicides, are they affecting bees at all? Uh, like Roundup, the Yeah, we got big, big war going with the cement people, and and with the with the some of the other things that you spray on your lawn. I think we got them all under control right now. And here's what the, here's what the federal government did for us. Thank God, they required all those people to have beekeepers on campus to see if their material that they're turning out is in fact hurting the product, our product, such as food, da 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 da, da. And so all the huge companies now have beekeepers in residence. Are they all on us? No, we already know one guy, you gotta get rid of that guy, he's cheating. He's really testing. But, but for the most part, that was a good federal rule that the huge cement companies, the huge fertilizer people all have to have beekeepers on campus. Another question back there. Well, when you had mentioned swarming, Jim, well, I, I, it, it just boggles my mind. Ask um, it, ask, that's what kids do, they ask. The, why do they swarm uh, late in the season? Um, I, I've got five and every one of them swarmed between Labor Day and about the, the latest one was uh, five days ago. Yes. They had ample room. They got, they got the Taj Mahal, their space, everything. They swarmed. And they, they didn't like that queen. Place. They didn't like that queen. No, I don't know. That's, that's the part that we don't know. We to, a lot of research still would be done. But they don't know why in your particular case. If they had plenty of room, they, they shouldn't swarm. But, 
Maybe they got foul fruit. Foul fruit is a, is a disease that kills. That's my leg. I'm jumping around on one leg because of foul fruit. We, five years ago, we had foul fruit. You, you know what foul fruit is. You get it, and there's no cure. Once you're high, you've got foul fruit, and they spread it so quick to the other one. The only way to get rid of foul brood is to burn the hives. So we burned bees and all. I stood up on the top of the cemetery here. I cried because I had to burn 13 hives. Bees and all, the burn them. All right, so this year, this particular instance, my girlfriend who lives in Sodus has one good hive and one weak hive. The inspector left my place and went to hit hers. And that hive had foul brood. She so had to burn the hive. All right, he, well, he, they want to do it right there. Boom, dig a hole, burn it. Is that a fire? Pardon me? Foul brood. Foul brood. F O U L E B R O O D. Okay, so she had. So we brought the hive down to the orchard. Here. We bottled it all up. We poured the warm soapy water, which, by the way, kills, by the way, kills all flying insects. Warm soapy water. We poured warm soapy water on it, killed all the bees, brought it over here, set a nice fire, and we burned the hive. I got down to my house, and she went home to sodas. And I go, I better scrub the back of that truck pretty good because that, that I could easily spread that to my own house. I've already been through it once. I'm not gonna, I don't wanna go through it again. Okay, and so I did that, I scrubbed it. And then I got in my truck to back in and it wouldn't start. Well, <clears throat> I figured all the wheels are off. I got it at an odd angle here. So I pushed it, got it out in the middle of the road, right? Still won't start. So they, wrestling coach, you know, he got a hold of the wheel and he's pushing it back, he's pushing the car, I'm trying to get my truck out of the middle of the road. I heard this loud pop. I've heard the pop before. I'm a coach. It tore my Achilles tendon. <sighs> the good news is it's only 40% torn, but I've been jumping around for almost two months now. All because of all food. <laughs> That's what started it then. It's, it's a little more complicated than I'm making it, but, but foul brood is one disease we don't want. There's a lot of diseases out there for bees that we did not have when I started beekeeping 42 years ago. We have, we have some disease. We have noxzema, like the stuff you put on when it's spelled without disease, noxzema, okay? That's a disease of the springtime. And it's like the flu. The bees, bees get the flu, right? You get to hopefully the General directors are busy, they get them out of the hive, they don't spread them within the hive and they live happily ever after, maybe. Okay, uh, we have some other diseases where, where we have mites. We're gonna show you mites here. We're gonna pass around the mite sheet with the mites on it, circle, so you can easily tell them. With a magnifying glass, so you can actually see the mites. The, the mites don't really kill the hive. The mites reduce the size of the hive and affect the health of the hive. If the girls get, you know, beat up from disease, they give up. The bees actually do give up. We had a, we had a hive up there, northwest corner here. The hive just gave up. Was, that hive was not an unhealthy hive, but it got diseased a little bit. The girls got tired and they just screw up. The hive died, right? And that, that probably has already happened to you. I don't know. Um, the original question was, which I've forgotten. Why, what? Do they, why do they swarm so Oh, long? okay, why do they swarm? God, yeah. The mentality, I think, because there's no studies have been done that I know that can make that for sure. But here's, here's my theory on it. I think the bees know when there's something unhealthy going on in their, in their house. And I think they're smart enough to maybe help control that. And one of the ways is to get the hell out of it. And so they split, and they have to hide goes. The swarm goes, boom, they're gone. And maybe the next queen takes over, the new queen takes over. Maybe she's laying healthy stuff. Her, her genes may be better. She's now mating with drones from before, which are all right. Guys are never wrong, you know, it's all these women, okay? So, you know, you just don't know. So the big thing is keeping your hive number healthy. If you've got 30,000 bees, we try to keep the 30,000 bees happy. And we try to make it so that you know, they have a happy home here and we're tending you and we're not bugging you. We're not in there every other day. We're just in there once in a while checking. Okay, and I think if, if you do it, if you get that mentality, like this year, we have 18 hives. I only wanted 50. We added three by accident and we're, we're, 
all our hives are healthy and happy right now. We still got a month and a half till the snow flies. Okay, and, but we're gonna continually check, continually check. If we see something that we think we can control, uh, we'll do it to it. All right, let's do the hive because I'm sure there's more questions there. All right, this is a regular hive. It does not have a, a honey box on it yet. This is just a regular hive. And right, we take that top off, it's pretty heavy. We put a brick on top of it uh, because we don't wanna have the top blow off, which we have had time. Of course, why? Because Oswego, New York has more wind than anywhere else in the country. Underneath there is another board and it's called the, oh my God, we got to be with us. <laughs> she came in. That was the yellow jacket, by the way. Okay, this is called an inner cover. And all it does, it, when the moisture goes up, it's funneled through this hole in the wintertime. Okay, and we want that moisture to go up on top of this particular piece of wood. We have burlap to, to absorb that moisture that's coming up. Because where there's heat, there's moisture. Okay, so we've got a place for it to go. It goes out, uh, it collects on here. It does not drip on the bee. One drop of water kills a bee like that. So we try to keep the moisture off. That. And that's what the inner cover really is all about. Inside here we have, this called a queen excluder. All right, this, and this is not a very clean one, but this sits on top. The queen cannot get up through here, nor can the drone. The only thing they get up to there is our, our girls with bringing honey and nectar and so on and filling the honey box. We want that queen down where she belongs in the lower box doing her thing. We don't want her up there in the honey. Are there ever two queens in a hive? There are. We had a hive a number of years ago, which had 70,000 bees in it. And we had a queen up in the top and we had a queen down in the bottom. And they lived happily ever after for the whole year. They did not get, it, get after each other, they did not kill each other. That's unusual. One queen usually. First queen hatch kills all the other queens. Perforates itself, stings them, kills them. One queen, only one queen. You only have one ruler. Okay, inside here are some frames and we're gonna pass these around so you can get a look at them. This is synthetic comb. Brand new, hot off the market. We got a full, we get full size and we got small size. No smell. I'm not sure the bees like it. We have two experimental hives in, in my yard at home. And uh, when Karen's class was there the other day, we actually went in there and looked and they are laying eggs in it and they are storing honey in it, but reluctantly they're doing it because they ran out of room. Okay, and so they're, the, but I, I'm not sure that you can, give synthetic stuff to bees. Now, number one, they've done a very good job of this because the comb in there is at a seven degree bevel. Why? Why do you think that's at a bevel? If you didn't have it, what would happen? Honey, Honey would flow out. So you got a seven degree bevel, bevel that holds it in. They cap everything. And you can see by looking at the observation hive there, the capping. This is a used piece of comb. And I pass this around for many reasons. Number one, this is as nice as you get to look at that. We've, we've had some disease stuff in it, so we peel some up, but it's, it's it, you know, this is brand new comb. This is drone comb. The, the drones are bigger, and so they got to have a bigger hole. So the queen, when the queen and it, by the way, any female bee can lay an egg for a drone. The queen usually does that because she controls the population of the hive, but any drone could, but this is drone comb here. Okay, why did they build it up in here? I have no idea. I mean, these bees are keeping it off now. Right? And it's on both sides of this frame. So this is an old frame, pass it around, can't hurt it. This is brand new, this is artificial calm. I'm not sure what it's working. We've got it in these experimental hives. It appears to be working. All right, also in here, we've got a different type. Now this is plastic. I'm not a big fan of plastic. I don't like plastic bottles. I, the bears that I brought you today with honey in it for you to take home is plastic. I don't like plastic. I'd rather have it in glass, but they only have the bears in plastic. Right, but if you, if you take this and scratch this with your hand, with your fingernail, you can feel the wax that they have poured on here. Okay, the manufacturer has poured the wax on there. This smells like, like a bee smell, all right? This is another one. This is another hard part. Take your fingernail and see if you can dent it. All 
All right, let's do it. I like the smell. I don't like the smell of the black one. The bees do the dark comb better. That's why we have dark cones. They, if we're in a big hurry and we want them to build up on it, that, that, we put the black comb in there. This is an indoor feeder. Kind of scuzzy, but we, we put syrup in here. Two to one syrup in the, in the fall, one to one syrup in the spring. You must feed them light in the spring. If you feed them heavy syrup in the, in the spring, half the time they won't take it. The other half of the time, it doesn't do anything. So light syrup. All right, you need to move that box out. Okay, there goes the brood box. Any questions so far? If one drop of water will kill a bee, they must be able to sense when there's two and avoid trying to pollinate them. And how do they know it's going to rain? That's a good question. I don't know. But we know enough that the bees, I know this. And, and we listen to this. What the, I don't listen to it because I don't hear well. No, I, I don't listen well, period. But anyway, the bees tell us, okay, it's going to rain, coach. Can't you feel the humidity? And they fly around your head. And we should go right there. We should, okay, tomorrow. We'll come back tomorrow. We should close the hive up and say, screw it. Go on to the next. But sometimes we don't do that. Sometimes we want to be better than the bees. We want to get in there. And that's when we get stuck. If we just did what the bees told us to do, we'd probably never get stuck. Question. Oh, I, so the majority of the bees live in that area of the brood box where their combs rest. And if you were to, so what would you normally put in there? Like if you were farming bees, would it be the black comb or? And it, 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 it depends on this one, okay? Right. If I was in a big hurry, I would put regular comb, drawn comb in there. If I had it, we have it, we save it. We got some scuzzy stuff that we collected out of there. We got to clean it up before winter and we put it in our storage shed. And if we really need it, we'll sock it in there. Okay, but if we don't, we throw it away the next year. Okay, but, or I could put this new stuff, these two hives that we got it on. And by the way, we, we put a regular queen that the bees raised themselves in one hive and we put a bot queen in the other hive, just to see if it made any difference with the, with the new comb. It hasn't, they're both doing the same thing. But there's a difference between the two hives because of the two different queens. One hive is really strong already and got two boxes on top of it and got honey. We, we might take a box of honey from that. And we've only had it there maybe eight weeks. So we might get a box of honey from that. The other one, we're not gonna get any honey from that. And that's okay, yeah, that's okay. We don't have to have honey from every hive. We'd like to have honey from everybody, but we don't always get it. So which one produces? Pardon me? Which one produces more, the old queen? Which one produced more, the old queen or mm -hmm. the I don't know if I know the answer to that because I don't know the answer to that. I don't know why that one queen, other than the bees raised that queen themselves, was maybe more natural. I don't know why. We got a lot of hives. In, I don't know. We got we got a couple of hives out in the orchard. We have one one apiary which is over in the eastern side. We got four different hives there. The, the bees in these four hives are different. Every single one of those, they're not all the same. You go down to the one that's in the middle by the pairs, they're all the same. You go in the northwest corner, they're all the same except for one hive's a little touchy. Then touchy since the bear got there. We have trouble with bears. All our hives now have electric fence around it. We got the box that makes electricity. We got two wires running around that for Mr. Bear. Mr. Bear put us out of business. I'm gonna say 10 years ago, we had six hives at Rudy's. I came and the hives were all tipped over and I thought, ah, damn kids have kicked over these hives. I said, we set them all back up. Come back two days later. Now they're all tipped over and there's, and there's frames all over the place. Right? And I, I, all of a sudden, I look at one frame, it's only going to get a big bear print right in the middle. <laughs> all right, so I called the DEC guy. I said, all right, what do we do about these bears? He said, you don't want them. I go, we don't want them. He goes, they're going to be in your house tomorrow. How far do you live from Rudy's? I said, mile and a half, it's a group life. He says, they'll be there tomorrow morning. He was kidding, but you know what? He was right. They were there. We were ready for them. We had motion lights. We didn't have the electricity in there yet, but we had motion lights. 
and and uh, we, I can't think of right now. But anyway, there comes the bear, big sow, three hundred pounds plus. I'm not dealing with. It. I can't treat it in the city anyway. All right, and she's got a little cub with her, worth about a hundred pounds. They're both out there. They're helping themselves. The little bear is he's not even eating all the honey. He takes three bites and goes on to the next. You know, if he'd be just doing it on one frame, I'd be okay with that. No, I, I was really upset because uh, we couldn't shoot the thing. What could we do? We ended up putting electricity around all our hives. All our hives, you don't grab the wire because it's hot. It'll give you a joke. Question. Do you do you baconize your your wires? Because what I understand about this, and I haven't had to do it myself though. If you have electric around your hives, it doesn't do anything if a bear takes a swipe at it and knocks it all down, which they can do fast. If you don't, if you put bacon on your wires, they'll they, if they bite it, then they're gone. <laughs> and leave it, let it rot, whatever. I've never heard that. That's a good idea. I've heard it from a very, very uh, successful beekeeper. Make sure you put bacon on your on your wires and Hang it, let huh? it leave it there. Like spring it through, let it doesn't attract them. They, but they'll they'll bite it. They'll bite that first. You hope. And that's what will save your hives because if they swipe or they want to get in past the electric, your electric's not going to stop them. I, I'm not being smart now, but have you ever seen a 300 pound black bear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, uh, I don't I deal have... with them. I don't deal with them where I can't shoot them, and I'm, <laughs> my hives are all in the city. So, but 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 here's the funny thing: when I ran down, I ran obviously ran down because. The, the stupid bear was tearing my stuff apart and uh, I screamed at the sow and, and she took off. She ran over to Albany Street and went west, went east. The little guy, he's hiding behind the bar. My grandson kept saying, Grandpa, I think he's behind the bar. I go, nah, that's all I was talking. The grandpa I saw, him. he was peeking out. And so we went and did some work over there and all of a sudden there's that little cup. He ran right out and grabbed the frame, ran right back. We had to go around the barn, neighbor next door, and kick it out. He too went to Albany Street. He too went east. I think he's that brother. But uh, bears are bears are pain in the butt for beekeepers. And we have not, but we got electricity running all our hives now, so we don't really know whether we're keeping them out or, and we don't hang bacon. But <laughs> but uh, if if I had a bee, if I had a bear problem, which we could have over here in the northwest corner, because it's pretty wild back in there. Um, I'll try to bake it. <laughs> but let me tell you about the deer and the woodchuck. Oh, I lost the war to the woodchuck. The woodchuck beat me. Yeah, I haven't lost many matches in my time, but I lost one to the woodchuck. The woodchuck kept, every time I grow beans, beans get this high, woodchuck eat them. So I put lower electricity. I actually put chicken wire on the ground tied it into another box, not the box that goes around the outside, okay? For somehow, the woodchuck figured he jumped the fence. He jumped the electric fence, went in there and ate the damn beans again. I had three plantings of beans, I got zero. Woodchuck got them. Now, we have nice corn that I grow. Oh, sweet corn, love sweet corn. The deer all of a sudden decided they can jump the fence. They jumped the electric fence. It's a three strand. It's a four strand, but the bottom strand probably doesn't have a lot of electricity in it. But the, but the deer jumped it. So, and then the deer evidently, because we tricked the deer. We're, we haven't, we're not a rookie at this. We've done this before, okay? We put another wire with another box inside the garden. The deer must have bumped against that wire because there's a hole where he went through the fence. You know, he just tore all the fencing when he went to we got them. She won't be back for a while. I think it's a big doll. But but she got all my corn before. You. What are you going to do? They don't. So far, we've been lucky in that we've had. You know, we don't have a lot of varmints that, that bother our hives. We've been, we've been we're, we're happy about that. Question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we like hives that are not in the cold. Yep. Um, so much of this is artificial. If you, do you do that different? Yeah. I mean, let me tell you, something. I like it too. But the bees don't like it. You, what you do is when you do that comb stuff, they're individual boxes, okay? And so in a, on a particular frame, okay, we got to, well, you guys got all the frames out there. But anyway, okay. So there's like four, six, eight boxes 
individualized boxes. The bees put the honey in them. First of all, they build a comb in it. Then they put the honey in it, and then they cap it. And then hopefully you take it up and sell it. And I love it. That's good, but what a pain. Bees don't like to do that. Bees don't like to go in one spot. It takes them out. You have to devote one hive to just that. And then you're lucky if you get, well, you'd be lucky if you got 48 of those boxes. They just don't like to do that. They resist stuff. And the way they beat you is they just resist it. They won't do it. Question? Yeah, somebody else had a question? Yes, sir. So I may be jumping ahead, Jim, but how do you harvest the honey? All right, that's, that's a good question. It, unfortunately, the, the equipment that we use to harvest honey is too big. I'd probably have it here. But anyway, we have a big cylindrical affair like this. And uh, the, uh, the frames set like this in this big cylinder. In fact, it holds 12 of them. And it, we kind of whipped it out. It goes around and around and around. And it gets a little bit faster. We slow it down. We speed it up. And it spits the honey out to the side of this big vat. The honey runs down the side, comes out on the bottom with a little spigot. We strain it two times, get the big chunks out, and then we put it in a bottle. So that's what we do. Now, it sounds like easy. It takes three people. And I'm going to tell you something. Every knob in your house Every faucet <laughs> is sticky. There is no way to get rid of that stickiness. When we're all done extracting, we'll go through and clean all those handles. Right now, you grab a hold of the doorknob and your hand stays right there, it's sticky. So it, it's, it's hard. I, I do the cutting. My, my friend Jake and some of the other people that work for us when we do this have all think that, well, they think I'm an artist, and I am when I cut this. You know, it's hard work though. You try it. Can you do it, Jake? I think I oh, I not very much. Run. Okay, he's learned how to do it. Okay, but it, it's hard. So I take those cappings, I give them to Frank Bernardi, who was a friend of mine who lives up on a hill who had bees, got tired of bees, got tired of losing bees. And, and he does this process where he works everything through. And when he gets all done, we get beeswax. Oh, the most wonderful smell in the world is beeswax. We take a, a four by one inch thing and we put it in every room in our house. Our whole house smells like a beehive. I mean, it's, a, it's a nice smell. Smell it. See, I think you'll agree. It'd be good to have your house smell like that. All right, back to the hive. Now, on, way down on the bottom, we got a thing called a slatted rack. And this was invented by a guy from New Hampshire who deals with the same cold we do. He doesn't deal with the wind. Okay, but he deals with the same cold. And he claims <laughs> that this helps keep the <clears throat> flow of air that comes through the bottom and up to, that keeps it right in the slots. This is a nine frame one. We run nine frames. Some people run 10 frames. Some people run eight frames. We run nine frames. The front part of this allows the, the heat from the hive not to escape. And plus it gives the bees another level to gather and shoot the breeze. Now you think the bees go out and back, out and back. Not so. There are women. What is the one thing that women do best? Chatter, chat, chat, chat. They get in here, they have little chat sessions. You'll see a little bundle of bees here, bundle of bees there. And eventually they'll work their way up, take their load upstairs and or go on out. They do, they gather, female bees gather. This is an entrance reducer. This is, we run this big entrance in the summer. We run this little entrance in the, in the winter time, obviously to keep the air out. All our bottom boards are screened bottom boards. And there's a reason for this. They used to be solid. They're now all screened. Bees are like cats. They groom each other. When they're hanging out doing this chatting that I was just talking about before, they groom each other like cats. And they knock the mics off them. The Varroa mite, which we're going to show you in just a minute. All right, the bro Varroa mite is hanging out to the bee. They knock the Varroa mites up. The Varroa mite drops all the way down through, drops through the screen, hits the ground, cannot get back in the hive. And so we get rid of them. We try not, and we have three hives that we're going to treat, but we try not to use chemicals in our hives if we can help it. We have three hives that we've got to treat for Varroas, and uh, we will do that. The directions call for two of these strips in each box. We don't do two, we do one. And sometimes we only do one, and sometimes we only do a half. The damn stuff kills the queen. So 
you do if you do, you do if you don't, you know. But we, we don't necessarily follow all the directions given to us by manufacturers. For us, we, we know that it can injure queen, so we don't do it. Now, in the wintertime, there's a sheet that slides in the back of our hive, okay? And that keeps the cold air from coming up through. So we try to reduce that amount of cold air. We also wrap it. This is the insulation that we use. It's cut. Each hive has its own little has a little door that goes in the doorway so they can get in and out. Then on top of this, Peter Raby had this stuff come in that, that we think is really windproof. So on top of this insulation, we also put a wind wrap. And we think it helps keep hives in Oswego, New York alive all winter. So we're a big fan of this insulation. We're a big fan of the Peter Raby stuff we put on the outside. Uh, this is show and tell. Each of, everybody has everybody has a that's a beekeeper has a tool has a hive tool stick it in your pocket I'm telling you right now don't have this thing facing out you're going to cut me all right but you go, but you're also going to cut yourself so you have to be careful both these things are sharp all right this is a light one this costs more than that one this one's better all right every beekeeper has one or two we lose these as we probably lose these more than any other thing we lose in beekeeping. We leave them in the highs, we leave them on the ground, we leave them in the truck. They're $12.32 a piece. Okay, now, the mic show. I'm gonna pass this around, and if, maybe if you get in, in couples or something, look at it. I have made it easy for you to find mites. I have circled the mites. This is a, called a sticky board. We throw the sticky board in on the, at the bottom of the hive. We leave it there for a 48 hour drop. All right, and then we pull it out. And then we look at this board and this board will tell us a lot of things about what's happening in that hive. Number one, how many, how many um, mites do we have? This one here had enough that we treat it. This, if, we, if we have more than five mites on the sticky board, 48 hour drop, we treat it. Now, if there's a question, if it's a tie, we wait a couple of days, we do it again. I don't like to use chemicals if I don't have to, but sometimes it is necessary to keep. These are two different boards from two different hives in the same apiary. This one's a dirty, dirty board. There's a lot of stuff going on in there, but I have circled the mites. There's a whole lot of other stuff. There's stuff on here that look like mites. We have furnished the magnifying glass, so you can check it and you can look at mites and pass it around. All right, <clears throat> what have we not done? Oh, we haven't done this time. Uh, this is a new, by the way. Can you grab that for me? Put that, maybe put it up on the front there. This is a nuke. What do you use a nuke for? When we, if, if you buy bees, you usually buy, they say 30,000 bees, probably closer to 20, but you have 20,000 bees and a queen usually comes with the box, okay? And you're wise to start it out in a nuke, which is a small hive, okay? So everything about this is the same as a big hive, except it's small. Now you can believe this or not. I think it's important to let the bees have confidence that they're capable of surviving in the frozen north. I put them in here. If, they're, if they really get this thing filled up where there's a lot of bees, a lot of stuff going on in there, then I promote them to the big box. But we start every single one we bought, what did we buy this year? Nine, we had nine? We, okay, we, we had nine nukes to start the year. We actually got 200 pounds from some of these nukes that grew into good hot. But we started them small we, so that they gain confidence. Yeah, we can do this. We can live in the frozen north. That's what we go to. We can live here. And, and we, I, I really think there's something to that. I think. The, they, they get strong in this hive, you put them in another big box, they keep continuing to get strong and they live happily ever after for us. This is a little different. This is a quick move, get the heck out of there, type the top, you can put a strap around this and run with it and move it to another location. The, the word on the street, and we have a guy, Cornell University, it's, it's a long story, Cornell University does a really good job for the beekeepers of the North. They, they have some awfully great people there. And they have a guy there who writes some terrific books. And uh, 
and he has this land up on Lake Champlain. They have 9,000 acres that were given to him by some rich alum. He won't let anybody in there except to tell you, he wouldn't even take me and I'm a friend of his. Come on, take me with you. Ah, nobody can go in there. But he does all these studies in there. He's, he's really, he's a real scientist. And, uh, but he won't take anybody in this. He don't want any human intervention here. He wants it his way, no way. Like I said, he wouldn't even take me and I think I'm a personal friend of his. Tom Seeley is his name, he's read a good book. If you want to buy a good book to read, Democracy of Bees, worth the read. It's a, it's a good book about people, it's a good book about bees. It's called Democracy of Bees, Tom Seeley, Cornell University, great book. But he also does some great stuff in research. So if we need something, and we can truck our stuff. I drove them crazy for a couple of years. I'd throw stuff in my truck and drive to Cornell. It was close. You know, and I, and I go to the labs there and say, all right, here I am, where's Sealy? I want to talk to him. And I'd say, okay, here's what's wrong with this. I think, tell me. And he'd go, no, no, that's not what's wrong with this. This here's what's wrong with it. Okay. So Tom Sealy is my is my buddy. If I needed to get something, I could run this stuff down to my corner. I don't think they do that in this day, but. But uh, so remember that name, Tom Seeley, great man, right in our presence here. What else haven't we done? We haven't done the sting yet. What happened to the tweezers? Uh, I had some little tweezers. I wanted you to see the tweezers. They're, they work the opposite of, of plus. When you, when you squeeze them, the jaws go open. That allows you to grab bees and uh, we have honeybees in here that came from a hive that's on my porch. I have, every year we, we buy queens and we requeen where necessary. And we store the queens in a nuke like this. And then I reward the best queen. I give her a prize. Okay, I give her her old house. So I put a, there's another box that goes on top of it. We give her a second box. They're now in the second box. And you ought to see those bees, they go crazy. My, queen, my cleaning lady wouldn't go out to get the key to the barn because she's the key to the house for the barn because she said the bees were swarming. They weren't, it was all these bees. They were happier than hell. They're all flying, they're out there, they're out there doing their thing. They've just been rewarded. I gave them their own queen. They've been keeping queens all summer for us. We kept 12 different queens in there. They fed them, they kept them happy and we sold them or we put them in our own house. Okay, so that's the story of the, of the queen bee. Anybody need, anybody got any mal? Oh, question first. What do you sell a queen bee for? What's the 35 matter? bucks, that's a good story. When I first started bee keeping, queens were $8. They're $35 today. You're very careful. I put a queen in, uh, I think it was two years ago, brand new queen. I did not put her in a box and put her in there and let them get accustomed to her. I was a big damn bird. So I just turned her loose in it. And she flew up and she's out of limb. I can't reach her. 35 bucks right there, I can't reach her. She never came back. I don't know where she went. $35 flew away. Hmm. That's a true story. I know you don't believe that, but that's a true story. <laughs> okay, anybody got a malady that they want stung? Anybody got nerve enough to be stung? No, I heard all no. <laughs> Oh, 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 I heard so. Doesn't hurt. That, bee, that, that little girl had the nerve to sting her master. And she's still healthy. She'll run around for a while, but it's all she wrote for that bee. Now, who's got the magnifying glass? Let me throw them. I got two bees. One's going to sting me in a minute. Here, I want you to look at this. Look, if you did justice to you. The sting is right there. It's got a little bundle right on the top of it. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a venom sack. The venom sack is going like this. Yeah. Now look at that. There's a venom sack. Uh -huh. One minute and 30 seconds. And then that's gone. <laughs> so I'm going to take one minute and 30 seconds for the amusement of the group. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this bee here recognizes her keeper. That bee there just kind of hanging out, crawls around. I have hairy arms, so she'll stay right there. 
And do I trust her? I do. Because the other one stung me because I got the cap out of her. Whenever we get stung, it's our fault. It is not the bees. Our bees are very gentle. We very rarely get stung by them being angry at us. We get stung because we do dumb things. We put our hands without looking. Okay, we make too much noise. I talk too loud because I don't hear well. Okay, and that bee's very happy because she knows my pheromones. Okay, we got more if you want to get stung. We'll try it on does not hurt after a while. How many? Minute, 30 seconds. Minute, 30 seconds up? I think it is. So we break it off. If your kids get, if you're, if you're in the country, if you live in a country, or you live where there's bees, and your kids are always getting stung, what do you put on the bee stick? I know you don't know this. A penny. A penny before 1950. Oh. Copper oxide. Copper oxide, that's because the penny had more copper in it before 1950, okay? And so it works better. The girls at the bank will save them for you if you ask them. Okay, I hand them out at the farmer's market. I give it to the kids. You get stung by a bee, slap that penny on there. Within 15 seconds, there is no pain. Trust the coach on this one. No pain, old penny works fine for bees. Put them in all your kids' pockets. They'll live happily ever after. How are we doing, Coach? Are we about the end of this talk? Am I boring you now? <laughs> All right, how about questions? Uh, yes, and I'll try to hear you. Have to, yeah, that's better. Have, I can be... have you ever experimented with horizontal hives? I have, and this lady still has it. She lives in, uh, what's the little town going before your animal? Oh, yeah, but she lives out there. She had, and I think she still has it, horizontal hive. There, there's, a, there's a cult of these people that really think that's the way to go. And I, 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 they, they were, they were, and they're fun to deal with because you're not using anything to hold their, their wax stuff together. You have to be very careful when you pick up the comb. You try to get the honey on it. You have to be very careful because you, yeah, it's, it's fun. If you only had one or two hives, that might be fun. They were, I don't think they work very well if you're trying to make a buck or two. By the way, we've never, I don't keep good records, but I'm telling you right now, you know, I don't think we've ever made money. That much. We might have made money when we were running 30 highs. We might have. But what we do do, we take all the money and we, and we go to B conferences. We've been to B conferences all over the US of A, and we go to two or three a year. And uh, so I get smarter, I think. And I hear other people tell me the same problems I've got. And, uh, and it's, it's just a big world of beekeepers out there. The days of, of uh, being different because you keep bees is gone. And you guess who are the most active beekeepers? All the women of the world. There are two to one women keeping bees now as compared to men. What's exciting about that, girls? I want to know. The sex of the bee is hard to see, but he can tell, and so can she. That queen is such a lively soul. She has no time for birth control. <laughs> that is why you see so many bees. You know Tony Leota? You know that Tony Leota's poem? Dan, that bee could live with you in your house. You would keep, very keep the bee. Not very likely. <laughs> So More that, questions. If you put that bee that loved you on someone else, it would stand? No. Yeah. What? Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> 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 I swear I didn't know. No, I didn't. <laughs> If you're, if you're wise and you're able and you grab it by the head, the bee cannot sting you. Is there anybody who needs to sting? Okay, my wife, when she was alive, she's been dead four years. She had these little bumps on her fingers that would come up and they're like little birthmarks, but she had, I stung every single one of her bumps off both her hands. I stung it four times. Wait two weeks, sting her again four times, and they disappeared. 
I have a big, used to be a big brown beauty spot here. We all got them, us old people. I have stung it away. I sting it. When I think of it, I just sting it. It's gone away. A lot of good uses for bees, by the way. Come on, somebody would like to get stung. I'm good. He's good. He's good. Uh, Too many times, right? You got it. What, what do you want to get stuck? Is that a duty march? Your thumb hurt? All right, now. Back in the days when we did apotherapy, I had to learn acupuncture points of the body. I, I still have the book. And it's best if you stay in the acupuncture points. And now that bee's gotten away from me. I don't know what I do. All right, but we sting acupuncture points, or in this case, we sting pain. And she volunteered. Let me get another bee. You get it. Or the head. Wait a minute, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. I want to sting your thumb. I'm glad you told me. Yeah, I don't think so. I think you got it. <laughs> you got the one on the floor, Coach. Yeah. There's one right here. There's two. Not those. No, no. All you have to do is grab it by the head. All right, I got one last beat. Nobody wants to see. <laughs> Little bee, you escape. Yeah, this guy can push down on it. All right, more questions. We're good for another hour. No, we won't talk about it. There's some good stuff to look at here. Now, in here, I want you, I want you to pass by here anyway, because they like the bees like to say hi to you. Okay, but the queen is longer, fatter, no stripes. In this case, you have to look very careful because she's, she's not as fat as she might be. But there is a queen in here, it's on this side. I see her as I look, all right? There's probably 600 bees on this side, 700 on the other side. And I'll answer any more questions. You're gonna have bees next year, right? You're gonna to take them <laughs> south and bring them north. Not a lot of work. It's the most fun I've ever had in my life. You, you, you just have so much fun with it. Bees teach us something new every day. Every day they, they teach us a new trick. What? I've been worried about it all the time. I'd be like Scott checking in on all the time. Yeah, Scott does check in. <laughs> um, can I answer any other question? What is bothering you? All these the third graders ask lots of questions. Your mother got stung last week. Hey, Jim. Yes. Can I? No, no, nobody's going to buy honey here today. I brought honey for everybody. Everybody takes home one bare thing of honey. Another question. Another question. Do bees sleep? I don't think bees sleep. They, they're, they, they slow down at night. They don't move as much. Their pheromones are not how they think. Okay, we just they, we've opened up hives at night yeah. with all of them. See, and they don't move around much, but they don't fly at night. Um, they get it, and they know it's going to rain. Most of the time, they yeah, get here before it rains. Yeah, we always Is that the one that's the big timers roll when they go? They take the thousand yeah, hives. They'll have five hundred hives of bees on eighteen whatever. They drive all the way. To the west coast of the almonds. By the way, yeah, no, the, the almonds of California are that, that's a major crop in the world. It's all and it has to be pollinated. The, the, the almonds of California have to be pollinated. Everybody that's in the bee, big bee business takes their trucks to California and they come back. Northern route, they, they do grain all the way till they get to Massachusetts and then they pollinate blueberries. I'm not sure what the South does, but they pollinate all the way back, stopping in different communities. They drop for maybe they drop the uh, highs for maybe a week or two here, a week or two there, and on to the next. They little bit, and they, and they make a nice buck. At last counting, it's eighty-five dollars a hive for pollination. So multiply that times a thousand. That's what the guys make every time he drops that low. Can you? It's like 
take a hive and put it on a truck and drive somewhere. Yeah, that's what they do. Yeah, and and obviously they block the entrance. In. Right, yeah. yeah. They put entrance blockers in there. They do have drive across the country. Everybody that's in the big time, everybody with a thousand hives or more goes to the almonds in California yeah, in the springtime. And then they work their way back. The bees aren't disoriented by the bees. Nah, you know what? Bees adapt and adapt easily. You know, like this, this hive that I told you about, the, the nuke, we got a double nuke on our back. I'm going to take it out to the orchard. We lost the hive out there. For, we don't know why. So I'm rewarding and I'm going to, next week, I'm going to put it in a double box so they have a full hive all their own. They're going to have new digs. They're going to be happy. And they're going to have new neighbors that they can play with. And what better, right? you know? And, and if they're lucky, they become a 58-day-old bee where they live all winter. And boy, I tell you, it's all women in there, you know. It's all talk. It's all jabber inside that hive all winter long. We don't see any drones till about in the vapor. And now we start seeing piles of drones out in front of the hive when they kick them out. Okay. Every once in a while on the internet, you'll see something about saving the endangered bees. Don't take them off of fire hydrants and other things where you see them swarming. But then it tells you to put out bowls of water with them with um, marbles in them so they can get drinks. That, from what you're saying, that doesn't sound like a very good idea. Oh, they need water. This, this, this one has water on it. It's got water, a little water bottle there. That, that happens to be sugar water. I wanted to be sweet when they came and so I gave them sugar water, big treat. So if you do that, the important thing is to make sure the marbles are above where they can. Yeah, because so they got to have something to land on so they can, and they suck it out, but they're, Wait, is it really necessary or can they get that from dew drops? And... Well, I don't know the answer to that. I, I think probably they could thrive without that. If you notice, like in this jar here, we, there's little holes. They, they'll feed through that. Put that, you know, get it water. They'll stick their tongues up through. They get water, take it out, spread it out to the rest of the hive so the other bees can make honey. Most of the time, we don't do that to our hives because there's enough water around here where they can survive on their own. If we take them on a road, like the observation hive, we usually have water for them because we, we think it keeps them alive longer. I don't know what it does or not, but we think that. Um, wax, I, I just, I, I, I want to convince you to put beeswax in your house. Oh, that smells so good. If you don't, if you don't like to smell them beeswax. Where can you get that? From me. <laughs> no, I, could, I don't sell it. I give it away. Everybody has a helmet. Did, by the way, how, how would you tend these? They have bee suits. You can put them all on and they cover your entire body. You can put rubber bands around your head. Listen, folks, we tend bees in shorts and T-shirts. We've been tending bees for 45 years in shorts and T-shirts. And we very rarely get stung. And our, we have ratty old hats like this one. This hat loves me. And, and that's all we wear. And we don't, I, I, Jake hasn't worn gloves since he started with it. Does he get stung once in a while? Once in a while, but, but not very often. Is it worth it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the pay is good. <laughs> How about come some, some more questions? Oh, I should take you to Hannibal and listen to the third graders. Oh, my God, they got questions. They were when, when bees swarm, how far will they swarm? How, how much of the difference? How far? What's the difference they swarm? between the bees swarming and the bees swarming? Yeah, how far do they swarm? Well, they're they looking for a new home. Here's how it goes with the swarm. It's an interesting question. So the bees in this hive say, we don't have enough room. Let's get out of here. And so a whole bunch of bees will go all different spots looking for a new home. They'll go along here to Rice Creek. They'll go over here to, to Cemetery Road. They'll find my hives. They'll find a box. I got to tell you about the box in my tree stand. And by the way, you can't believe the number of bees there. Okay, well, I got a tree stand. I hunt deer out of it. Bees moved in. Anyway, they'll, they'll go there. And then all the bees come back. It's a democracy inside that hive, believe me. 70,000 bees, most of them girls talking and they come back and they say well we got a house here we got a house there and they chatter and they chatter 
and they go out again and look and they take friends with them and look and they come back and they chatter and tell them, now we're swarming, we're going, we found the house. Okay, we're going here, boom. They go up in the air. Jim LaFleur, who has passed away, was a good friend of mine. And, and uh, I actually saw the bees come out. We saw them gather. They got on a limb. They were so heavy, they broke the limb. The limb came down and there was bees everywhere. They reformed in another tree and then they took off. They took off this time to my tree stand where I hunt deer out of. It's 15 feet in the air. It's got a hive on top of it. It's a hive to collect swarms. They built underneath the sea. <laughs> oh. We build it, we give them a home, they build underneath the sea. So, Jake, we cut the stuff out so he can climb in the boat. He climbs up the tree stand. He takes some of the frames, puts them in the box, cuts it loose, puts it in. Okay, they'll go up there because we got brood and everything up there. You know, I went up there to, yesterday to look at them. They get a double layer of high. They, they have built everything. And they're outdoor bees. They think they're going to make it through the winter. And that's we go to New York living outdoors. Not going to happen. <laughs> but if you, if now, you took the queen and put her up there, they would fall out, wouldn't they? I, I, I've had this happen before. I, I had one swarm where it, where it came to an old apple tree. And they just hung out there. They didn't build any corn. They, just, they died there. It just got cold. The bees in the Baptist church, we took them down. Who was asking me about the Baptist church? My grandson and I went up in the lift and got them out of the Baptist church. They went right back. They're, they're, they don't survive there. We keep telling them, you don't survive. Come with us. But alas, they did not, so they'll die. Just like these bees. There's no way that we can move all those bees into another box. Well, there is a way, but it's tedious. So we probably are not going to do that. We're going to entice them one more time. You know why they didn't go in the box? Because I put a vial of a pheromone of another beehive in the box. Evidently the bees, when they got to that spot they wanted to go in, they didn't like what they smelled. And they said, we're tired of this journey. We're gonna set up shop underneath the seat. And they did. And they're there right now. There's probably 30,000 bees sitting underneath the seat of my tree stand. I can't use the tree stand. They didn't think about the coach. Oh, uh, we could tediously cut that all loose and put it in a box. We've done it before. We still may do that. We still may. Could you move the hive from the Woodruff building? Yes. Is that the one over on the east side? No, on uh, West First and Seagull. No, I didn't do that. No, I didn't get those bees. The interesting part is. The antique shop, we were talking before. What's that lady's name? Anybody know that has the antique shop out here? She's a graduate of Oswego. The red barn out here by Dennis's, Dennis Olette's place across the street. It's an antique, but she's never there. So I don't know if she sells any antiques or not. But, but anyway, the bees, we have taken four boxes of bees out of the back of that antique house. The bees come in because they keep telling you, you got to get rid of that honey smell. That means you got to replace all those boards. You got to seal that up. As long as that smell that the bees keep coming back. So the bees go in. We, we shouldn't leave a house there. We shouldn't leave a nuke there. Because every year we get the bees, they come back. We get the bees, they come back. Not the same bees, different bees every time. We've got four different boxes of bees on the back of the antique shop. Because this honey smell is always there. It must be a nice house inside. It must be well designed inside. The bees like the furniture and so on and so forth. <laughs> they're, they're staying, they're staying there. All right, any other questions? It's our pleasure to have been here. We had a good time. It's fun for me to talk to the, if, if you, I, I, and I don't mean this in a demeaning way. Well, I'm gonna tell you something. You, you talk to young kids, they're the best. Man, they got questions like you couldn't believe. I mean, they just, they're not afraid to ask questions. They're fun. I, I do either fourth grades or third grades. I, I think second grades may be too young. Although my grandchildren started with me when they were nine years old. And, and they went through till they were in their 20s most of the time. And most of them are pretty good. They can, we have, by the way, finding a queen is a challenge all by itself. It, it's longer, fatter, no stripes. Sounds easy, but not when there's 50,000 bees around you trying to pick her out. But there's a way to do that. It's mathematical. Your, your eyes have to read like this, and it's got to go. My grandson has that knack. If I, have a hive that I can't find a queen. I go get Mike. 
Mikey, and I bring Mikey with me, find the queen. He finds it it's mathematical the way you look. We find them most of the time because we're, we're uh, learned. By the way, the queen lopes, if, if you look at bees, the queen lopes, all the other bees scurry. That's the way I find it. How do you find it? I look for a circle of bees. Uh, she, to, to, that's what they do. The bees will look toward her and they're feeding her, grooming her. That's a good way to find her, too. Let's clap her. So, we have, you know, who could have more fun than us playing with bees? <laughs> <laughs> we do. It's, it's, it's a, okay. That's why, you know, we eat a lot of honey, too. Mm -hmm. We used to eat a lot of honey comb, but I, I don't like to have the bees do that, so I don't eat much comb. But, I'm 88 years old, still going strong. You know what? It's because of the bees. Yeah, I get stung all the time, plus I eat a ton of honey. <laughs> Not only am I old, but I'm sweet. And we did bring honey for everybody, and we have lots of snacks over here, and there's honey over there. For you. Take the bottle of honey, it's all for you. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank uh, you. Yep. First, I have one of the.